So I think that there's this idea in a lot of cli-fi, I think, of either producing a dystopia or a utopia <laughs> and not thinking about the connective tissue between where we are now and where we're going. And also that producing these worlds can sometimes actually make them happen. You know, she was very prescient, but also when you write, you are imagining possibilities that then can be made into being. So what kind of actual political responsibility do we have when we are just creating utopias and dystopias? And how does Octavia give us a third option, which is to write ourselves in, in a complex entangled way to the present moment as being intimately entangled with the future? Wow, that's such a beautiful question. And I wanna say that one of the things that people can do or that her, I feel that her, I don't know what we would call it, so first of all, I want to say, I don't know what your educational background is, but Sophie, what you just evoked was the transcendent third, right? If anyone's heard of this idea of there's two, two things at play here, and I'm sort of a critical Jungian psychologist, right? I, I, I could throw some things away and throw Jung away most days, but to name some of these terms that we find in indigenous cultures and, and frame them in ways that we can talk about them. So one thing is this idea of that the pendulum swings in one direction, comes back and then it swings in the other direction. What Octavia said is that whenever there's any pro progress, there's always a backlash to that progress. And this is where we're experiencing. So that's one thing. And the transcendent third is she always presents us with both and neither nor simultaneity we cannot have utopia without it being a dystopia for someone else we cannot have progress without there being apocalypse somewhere else it's almost like this butterfly effect thing she's always calling into our best elements and our very worst elements at the same time and they coexist so for me I often do not enjoy reading so-called climate fiction because I feel that it's you know, preachy and short-sighted um, in many ways. And the places where I find climate narratives that are the most generative are often outside of that genre. So blending genres. And I will list some books that really address climate in ways that are innovative, speculative, but not just utopia or just dystopia um, that go beyond these bi false binaries that she simply did not believe in. We have to break down those barriers of, of bifurcation within ourselves. And I think that's what she, she calls us to do. I also, I mean, I wonder if, if you could talk a little bit about your experience of her characters, because I think that she also does something that we don't see a lot in um, morality tales or in, or in science fiction, which is she provides, a, well, and also she provides incredibly complex female characters who make morally dubious decisions and are, 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 are never easily um, boxed into either being good or bad. And I think that's what I found most attractive about her work is the complexity of her characterizations. What can we learn from that? I think she was very deliberate about this. She recognized that those parts of herself existed. Like, for example, the most one of the most heinous characters that she wrote uh, was Doro, who is this kind of represents this destructive immortality. But it comes from a part of her where she said, you know, when I grow up, instead of being like a dentist, a secretary or whatever, she's like, I'm going to breed people. And her friends were like, Octavia, that's weird and dark. But she's like, okay, well, what if? And so she plays this out. So she accepted that there were parts of her that wouldn't be acceptable to herself so that she had to really like tease those things out. I think what she was doing is this psychological work of breaking herself into pieces, letting those pieces live out to the fullest of how they could be. And that's how we get these really complex characters her female characters, if we can think about Kindred for a minute, right? Um, because Kindred has this pretty naive character who doesn't really know, like she doesn't understand what's happening to her or that she's also complicit in creating her own self in the future. And that if her many times great, you know, removed great grandparent 
does not give birth to like if she's not raped if she does not exist in this terrorizing environment that you know the character won't exist in the future and i think we are also all complicit we're here with our technology and all kinds of things not realizing the consequences of how they're impacting someone else on the globe like have you heard sophie about how they get the lithium for the hybrid and electric vehicles and where it comes from in the environment right yep I've been thinking about haunted technology, like it's been taken out of these landscapes, you know, all the poisonous off chemicals they've used to extract it or put onto the nearby communities. I mean, this is not clean energy. <laughs> right. If you have to destroy and evaporate all the groundwater for indigenous communities who can't yeah. get Nestle to truck their water back in, uh, then the rest of us are here not, you know, we're not adding fossil fuels, but then we've destroyed the ecosystem and livelihood of people in, you know, places like, I think it's coming from like Colombia, Bolivia, Ecuador, and some other places, right? So close to the Amazon too. It's like that we shouldn't be extracting anything from the planet in that area. But then, you know, they're saying, even here, they want to have some mines for it here domestically. And farmers are like, we don't want a 500 foot pit in the middle of our orchard or whatever. That's not how we want to live our life. Like, you know, she shows that maybe we need to do without those things and those privileges. What are we willing to give up to know how our, our beliefs are tested? And she continually calls us to the mat in that way and, and shows us what it'll be like without those things, not in a dystopia, there's still pleasure and beauty and, and connection to be found, but how can we value each other more and the things we can possess less? Yeah, I mean, gosh, there's so many places I wanna go. I don't know, have you read at all about the idea of dislocative fiction? Well, it's interesting because when I was reading about it, I was thinking about how that's often how I experience Butler, which is it's not a, in the future, in the past, it's an adjacent. It's the, it's the part of, it's, it's the shadow of what's happening right now that you're not inside of. You know, it, it's to the side. It's a spatial dislocation rather than a temporal dislocation. Um, but it's, it is also temporal. It's like an alternate reality where, I don't know, I'm probably dating myself, but did anybody watch Fringe? Did anyone watch this television show that was made by Fox called Fringe? Oh, yes. many years ago. <laughs> well, what happened is that this was this dislocative thing that was happening. There were at least two universes that we would switch back and forth during the later seasons, remember? And literally the, the matter of a building or whatever would be displaced if something happened to it in the alternate space. Mm -hmm. Like we're occupying that dystopia and utopia at the same time but in the show they would show what would happen or how harm or trauma would change one person or how one person would live without that trauma and I think this is what Butler was doing she's really ahead of her time in terms of manipulating you know it's like this sort of quantum understanding of how things are going you know simultaneously is really beautifully done which is why it's so interesting that Kindred her time travel novel is the one that will be made first. And I've seen the pilot and I've talked to the cast and some of the psychological dynamics of how that came to be are very Butlerian and very much what you're saying, disloc dislocative, like very much, jar it's very jarring and it, and it gives you, it, it sort of estranges you from your good self, the, the self that you think is the ideal self. It, it makes you, you know, it doesn't make you feel wholesome and warm and fuzzy. But you're like, yikes, what is it that I am doing that's contributing to this? I think one of the questions I want to ask is, you know, it's it's two part. One is that I think there's there can be an idea that storytelling is um, is not participatory. It doesn't make things happen. It's not dynamic. It's like a hobby. It's, it's, it's ornamental. And I think that Octavia makes a real argument in her body of work that it is an incredible powerful force for changing the way we think, the, the futures that we can imagine and craft, um, and the way we relate to each other. And so th that's one side. And the other side is, I think there's this idea 
that mythology and storytelling happen in this arch archetypal, pristine realm, rather than in television, in science fiction, in these kind of places where genre bends. So I, I was wondering if you could speak to the power of storytelling and the power of impure storytelling that salvages the materials that are available. Oh, Sophie, like my heart. This is something that I think I funda fundamentally believe. This is how reading Octavia Butler trained me to be a, you know, I'm just like blown away by how perceptive you are in so many ways. Um, we are being told that storytelling and mythology and philosophy are all these rarefied things that belong in the academy or even to the terrible, you know, Indiana Jones, like, oh, this belongs in a museum. That's how we're told that we should be treating these, arca arca um, these artifacts of culture, when in fact, I was thinking it's not even just, you know, you know, storytelling as being static and separate. When we go to the grocery store and we turn in the United States anyway, when you turn the package over and it has the nutrition facts or it says on the front gluten free, like we're being told a mythological pattern of consumption and what is wholesome and what is not stories are everywhere that is what advertisements are like in my home my children do not watch television they don't see commercials they don't see toys r us ads they don't know what those things are is foreign to them because those stories are also toxic but we buy into feeling comforted by stories um and they're everywhere like you know, all the things that come up in your for you timeline that have like, oh, get skinnier, stop smoking. Like there's stories everywhere. And for us to say like, oh, these are in a special place and we cannot touch them. That's another perpetuation of a mythology that doesn't exist. Especially I feel like as a person born in a black woman's body, there are stories projected onto me all the time about how I should be and how I should look and what I should aspire to and what the ideal is. And men suffer, people suffer under this tyranny of, you know, this locus of control of narrative. She breaks open what a narrative can be and how those stories are in our bodies and in the environment and fertilizing the soil of what we can grow to be as, you know, as individuals together with one another. So she's always both and I'm, you know, just deeply grateful for your question. I feel like we've written an article in this question. I feel like we have an entire, we've written something together and we're articulating this reality that, that, you know, the matrix is us and we're in the matrix, I guess, at the same time. And that's okay. And that's the way that things are. So I might just be gushing. I don't know if I'm even coherent. You're very co coherent. And um, it's just, I think this is a really exciting moment where a lot of people who haven't been who haven't been able to write themselves in have have created the ruptures and the breaks. And I know I, I was reading and I think it was an interview with you where you were talking about the archetype of change, you know, utilizes the capricious, complicated aspects of change, which is the rupture and the break to find your way in. Um, you know, that it, it's not always a, a savory, beautiful experience to take control of the narrative again. Um, right. Then, and what deaf psychologists say is that, you know, this is why Joseph Campbell is so popular and people are saying like your feminine side and your whatever, because we, we say like, well, what, uh, not like what myth are you living? We have this, his heroic narrative of a straight white male or the hetero patriarchal ideal when really we have to be asked what stories are living us, what stories yeah. are coming through us what are the things that are at play in our collective psyche that we're not attending to because those things will burst through this is why we have you know people dying of opioid addictions and it's primarily in poor and or white rural communities because those people were neglected while we were looking at you know the war on drugs or improving education or whatever like we have neglected entire populations of people because we wanted to punish the gays over here it's like the universe balances itself out and we need to attend to all of the people who are in need 
who need this narrative, ther this therapeutic narrative collective, you know, almost like mid midwifery, like of bringing people through transition. We're not having the rituals that enrich people's lives. 